ghosts. Hello, Ghostbusters. They're real. You do? They're mean. You have? They're here. Ghostbusters. Hey, anybody see a ghost? They catch the ghost that won't stay dead. They're armed. They're dangerous. Try to imagine all life as you know it stopping instantaneously and every molecule in your body exploding at the speed of light. All right, that's bad. Okay. All right, important safety tip. Thanks, Egon. Your girlfriend lives in the corner penthouse of Spook Central. You want this body? Is this a trick question? From the haunted heartland in Omaha, Nebraska, my name is Brian Corey, and it is my pleasure to welcome you all, ladies and gentlemen, to this episode of The Necronomicast with my guests from England, Anthony and Claire Bueno, the brother and sister filmmaking team that put together a fantastic documentary that's available now, Cleaning Up the Town, Remembering Ghostbusters. In just a few short days, Ghostbusters Afterlife is gonna be hitting the screen and we're gonna take a step back, a little nostalgia, and examine the original Ghostbusters that inspired not only pop culture for decades, but just rekindled a newfound interest in the paranormal. So, dim the lights and relax as I welcome Anthony and Claire Bueno. And now, joining us for a late night conversation, the brother and sister team of Claire and Anthony Bueno. They are the creative force behind cleaning up the town, remembering Ghostbusters. I'm so excited to have you guys on the program. Welcome. Thank you very much for having us, Brian. Hello, hello. <laughs> hello, and hello to your audience. Oh, yeah. Uh, so like we just established, I'm smack dab in the middle of the continental United States, and you guys are in England, and I'm so glad that this uh, time difference worked out. It hasn't always worked out great for my guests that are across the pond, but you guys are on the ball uh, your assistants that helped book this was on the were on the ball and no problems. I'm so excited. We're good. No, we're we're very excited to to speak to you and and to speak about the film as well. Yeah, exactly, we're very yeah. passionate about it, particularly after the well, it is now a 15 year journey. It was yeah. a 12 year journey to complete it, and now we're into sort of 15 years of of the film. So um, and we're so happy that it's had a release in America. Yeah, finally it's out there. Finally, I have to tell you, I'm 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 47 years old. When the original Ghostbusters came out, I was it came out in the summer of 84, so I was nine. And what an important, uh, formative film for a, a, a kid who was into superheroes and comic books, but also I started dipping my toe in the paranormal. And it just hit me at the right time. It hit America at the right time. It was just such a such a great film uh, for, for kids growing up. Uh, I'm sure you guys fell in love with it in a similar way. What, what made you to, you know, put this film together, this labor of love, this fantastic documentary? Well, that was, it, it's, it's essentially, it's my favorite film. And that, and that is like the, the long and the short of it. And like yourself, uh, went to see it at the cinema when it was first released. And, uh, and just, I, I, you know, it's hard to say how these films kind of work. You kind of figure that out when you get older and then you kind of realize that, I mean, there's some childhood films that you watch when you're a kid and you think, yeah, maybe not. <laughs> but there are others that just... Yeah, there <laughs> are nothing springs to mind at the minute, to be Yeah, fair. yeah. No, some you revisit, though, and you think, actually, what was the what was that? Yeah, it's actually, just like, I remember this like much that. better. <laughs> Ghostbusters has never done that. And the best ones just can... You know, you you grow kind of with, or they kind of grow with you. You understand elements of the film that you're you know, too young to understand then. And it's just... And when you get older, when I went to film school and kind of like I realized you kind of have to study films rather than sort of like kind of be taught how to make them, which is I've never done. I just always sat and watched the film and never really kind of inwardly digested kind of it. Kind analyzed it. But you do and you just like, it's just a great film. It's just extremely well made and everything, you know, every beat works. And, and it's just so it doesn't matter what kind of phase of my life. I've always loved it. And it's always been that film. And, and when in like film school, they'd say, you know, what's what's what was your favorite film? What influenced you? And everyone's like, oh, Quentin Tarantino, and you know, it's something like that. It's either Fight Club or it was, uh, or Pulp Fiction was generally what I'm going back a few years now as well. And I was Ghostbusters, the only one. 
And it was like Ghostbusters, and they, which I've always got a bit of a giggle. It's like, why? It's like, it's just exactly what I want when I go to the cinema. Pure escapism, good fun, and you come out in a great mood and you want to talk about it. It's just, even now, and, and even though I've seen it up to times on VHS and, and DVD and Blu-ray and going to the cinema, thankfully, because cinemas now really show all the, old, all the old films. So I just, I love it. So for me, it was my first film in... Yeah, and, and and for me, I'll give you a much shorter answer. But um, I get excited. Uh, yeah, you do just get really excited, even after making you know the film for so, such a long time. We we're, at, we're just as passionate about it than, than when we started out. But yeah, for me, um, uh, as you with you, Brian, it was the first film I was allowed to go and see actually as a as a teenager. Um, and uh, I was about 13, 14 years old without parent supervision. So I was there with my friends and, and I actually remember sitting in the, uh, cinema, you know, that I remember the seat that we were, that I was in and the clothes that I was wearing and, you know, being scared by the library ghost. And, and so for me, it was kind of like a rite of passage film really, but it, in, in fairness, for me, it was just a film I watched and enjoyed. For Anthony, it became kind of m- much more um, of, a, of a passion, you know, a Dan Aykroyd, like yourself as well, the, the whole kind of interest in the paranormal. Yeah. It sparked all of that. Um, and I have to say, for me, coming and making a film about Ghostbusters, I've probably got more respect for it now as a filmmaker having made a film about it and finding out how, you know, all the kind of intricacies that went into making it and the passion and the commitment and the teamwork and the, and the, just the, the genius behind how it was made gave me the respect for the film mm. that, that I've got today, really. Well, I have to hand it to you because I, uh, your production company sent me the, the screen copy or the screener's copy of it. It was two hours, seven minutes long. And I always have a fear sometimes when I either pick up a book or a magazine or watch a documentary that my favorite film or something that I enjoyed growing up is going to be deconstructed in such a way that I might, you know, it might lose some of its luster. But I have to hand it to you, after watching two hours and seven minutes of this documentary that you guys put together, I came away with such such a greater appreciation of what they accomplished in such a short amount of time. Now, I heard stories about Oh, you know, they they put the movie together in, in in relatively quick fashion, but the the stories behind it, behind the rewrites and how it was set in a different time period and how it was a much different film when it was first developed, when it was first pitched to the studio up until about three or four weeks before the release, when they were still, you know, like putting the uh, mascara and the makeup on the very end of the final uh, effects of the movie up until pretty much opening day. Uh, what a great appreciation that I've walked away with with Ghostbusters and what what they achieved. Did you, when you're putting in together a documentary like this and you're getting all this information and you're learning more as you're filming, does it change how you make and focus your documentary? That's a good yeah, question. It, it does yeah. because, you know, uh, uh, documentaries are organic, at least they kind of should be. You know, there's, what was the one documentary? It was like finding the filming the freemans or finding the freemans i think it was called and it was originally supposed to be about clowns in new york and it became a completely different thing because it turns out this one fellow was uh, related to a family who were accused of being pedophiles the dad and the brother and it never reveals whether they were or they weren't but it was fascinating and it's always stuck in my mind that you know docs need to be there that you know if you're truly going to document you know a, a period of time you've got to be able to kind of go with the flow and we, I remember going, we was going past, going through the old notes of like when we kind of constructed or like trying to construct the film out of it. And it's completely different, those notes, to what we actually made. It's what we, I think what we got is much more fluid and tells the story rather than, okay, well, we need to, we need to get, we need to get this bit told and that bit told. You know, there's a lot of bits that we cut out that I really wanted people to hear, but they didn't fit in the flow of the narrative. So it's just like, and it kills you. But all of a sudden, you know, if you, you know, there's a bit that, you, you know, it just kind of feels a bit off and you have to remove it and it works. And that was sort of like some of the painful decisions. So you do have to be very kind of mindful when you're kind of constructing something like this, that, you know, you've still kind of, yeah, go with the flow. And uh, I was just about to quote John Candy then. <laughs> like a twig on the shoulders of a mighty stream. Um, so it's, it, you know, it's, and, and we uncovered stuff that we either either had passing knowledge of or had no clue of. And 
as we were getting more and more interviews and which was an also an organic process there was like those people that we wanted to interview but there was some we couldn't find um and there's others we just didn't know about and it's like you interview someone who goes oh have you spoke to have you spoke to mark it's like no no we haven't oh well you want to speak to mark oh right okay and you speak, then you speak to mark have you speak to Stuart? no i'm just trying to find you oh well here's Stuart. and it and so we got we ended up it was gaining like a domino the effect wasn't it yeah, yeah it was great and it just you know, we we built such a mass and then, you know, and, you know, it's taken us years to make this thing. So there was an element of, you know, you you become very responsible because this, this is their stories that you've you've taken custodian. custodian? Yeah, 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 you become a custodian of their story, really. So, you know, All right. <laughs> without kind of wanting to, to sort of big, big ourselves up or anything like that. But it, particularly because it took us such a long time to make. Um, purely because of logistics and we self-financed the film for the at least for the first eight years um, of the film. Um, you know, people like Harold Ramis, we lost sadly, and and um, Terry Windell, and, and there was a, at least six people that we it's lost along the way. Idea. And so when you know that you're probably the last person that they spoke to in any kind of depth about their their encounters and their experiences working on the films it kind of gives you a bit your you then have to take on more responsibility um to to make sure that you're being authentic to them really yeah, aren't you exactly yeah. and, the, and the one thing that became sort of paramount as we continue to make the film is yes you like with any kind of documentary making of you you get to find out about the visual effects the special effects and the technical aspects but for us it was very much a story about the people mm. and I hope what people are getting from the film is actually it's about the people who made the film and the personalities and the richness and the and the characters and they're funny and they've got great personalities and hopefully it's it's a human interest story as much as it is a yeah. technical kind of this is how they made Ghostbusters, which I hope differentiates it from a normal behind the scenes, excuse me, documentary. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up about like uh, having Harold Ramis on the program and and having him on there and having him talk for at great length about his uh, development, how they, you know, the genesis of the movie and how they developed it and how he how he teamed together with Aykroyd to, to kind of. Uh, redo the script and everything. You do have a responsibility uh, to honor like his legacy and and his vision and the time that he put into it to to help you guys tell this story. Uh, and another thing that you you said, and, and I'm glad you brought it up. You interviewed all these stars, and you must have been starstruck, you know, being with Sigourney Weaver. You must have been starstruck, you know, being there with Harold Ramis and Dan Aykroyd and everything. But I got to hand it to you, I really enjoyed. And it's not nuts and bolts, but but the human interest, like you said, like Steve Johnson, the sculptor, he was really fascinating to me. And I thought he was a ton of fun because he had this great line talking about how the movie was, uh, I'm paraphrasing, but it was like the balance between utter failure and abject success and how these yeah. guys really went out on a limb, how they auditioned, like their audition was here, make make the zombie uh, cab driver. And if you can get it done in three days and it looks good, then you got the rest of the movie. And and he's so excited. They're so excited to get this gig to put together this zombie thing. And then they're going to work on this movie. And then now we've got a year long, just grind to, <laughs> to get this movie done. <laughs> so they're auditioning for the, for this job of their lifetime, but yet it's abject, it's craziness. It's uh, it, to get these deadlines and everything. And I have to hand it to you to have the cast and the crew, because boy, what an important story behind this movie, talking about the special effects, which are still so good in 30 years, 40 years later, uh, but how they how they accomplished all that. So you took the nuts and bolts, the latex and the sculpture and the animatronics and all, and all these special effects that were practical today and combining them with the real men and women who worked hard to put yeah. this movie together. What a great accomplishment, you guys. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, and that was, you know, because it's always the thing, you'd always, you know, the special effect, you know, the making ofs and all that kind of stuff. It's the main talent, you know, director, probably a producer, if it was J.J. Abrams, <laughs> and then like the lead people. And we were just like, if we could have found the cleaners, we would have interviewed <laughs> them because everyone has a story. Yeah. Everyone plays an important part. In, in any industry for that matter. And it's not just the film industry. So, you know, it was really important to get everyone there. I know like Mark Siegel, who uh, um, he sort of like part school 
bulked his line when he, we, he watched, uh, it was nearly completed cut of the film. And he just happened to be in the UK. Um, and he's like, oh, come around, you can like watch the doc. So we came and he sat and watched it. And he got really emotional. And he's just like, I, it's just like, it's completely transportative. And because we intercut his story about um, with John Belushi and then watching tapes of Animal House and, and getting the whole blue toe kind of vibe, kind of going through Slimer. And, and then you got Dan Aykroyd talking about it as well. And he goes, you, you know, you have indemnified. Is that the right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So absolutely. you've indemnified myself because I always talk about this, but no one else ever kind of like brings it up. So, and he, he got quite teary on a couple of occasions, thankfully, because he was enjoying it rather than thinking this is what I've been waiting all these, these years to watch. So it was, it's always been like, the heart of all of this was like the one rule was like everyone we interviewed appears in the doc, and and my only regret is that there's some people I would have liked to have had much more that like Bob Stevens and I was yeah. always someone I wanted to use much more than I was able to in the in the, the film because he's a lovely lovely fellow like uh, the, the camera off, but they all had these just great stories and some of those stories kind of interlap and and you can kind of edit them all together and it makes sort of like it helps it will make much more sense. But it was just and, it and was people a like and, and people like John Bruno, who you know helped us as well with all the kind of archive material. He, yeah. he lent us a wealth, as as did you know many others, Mark Brian Wilson, and um, Steve, Steve, and Steve Johnson. Yeah, yeah. But when we sat, we we sat and watched it with John Bruno, and um, and he was just like, oh my god. It's just like being there again, <laughs> you know. And so when you've got people who have worked on the film, who are being transported back to being there and it's bringing back lovely memories and they're actually learning stuff as well. Like, I didn't realise that. It's. It, I mean, we couldn't get a huge uh, compliment, no. could we, really? And we've had so much support from everybody that, that's been it, but was in the film yeah. as well. I mean, what the, what the one of the, what I wanted to try and achieve with the doc is that, you know, we wanted people to feel like they're sat in the room having a chat with these people. But the, 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 all the photos and all the right, we deliberately didn't polish them up too much because we wanted them to be look a bit kind of scrappy or dust on them as if somebody's just got the shoebox out and like, oh, here you go. And, and you know, people, you know, you can have multi-camera setups and stuff and we just didn't have the money for multi-camera setups. But certainly when we started, couldn't know actually. But anyway, <laughs> but we've got iPhones. I'm sure we can put it off these days. <laughs> um, but, you know, you know so just like we didn't have that type, type of technology back then. But it was, yeah, tape, it was all on tape. The original interviews were all on tape. It was, oh, oh the heady days of the, of the old analogue world. But it was, it was really important that that was the feeling that people had, that people feel like they're sat in the room with Harold as he's telling them a story about Ghostbusters and Richard and Terry and Steve and, and, and Sigourney and, and Dan. And, and it's, because, you know, I, I remember listening to like audio commentaries and when they first started, and that's what it was kind of feeling like sometimes. You were in the room with these people, translating that onto the screen in the best way that we could. And, you know, and there's lots of kind of different ways and means you can kind of go back that. But that was something re- I really wanted to have because it, was, it, it really was a pleasure to be with these people. And they were such a warm bunch. Mm-hmm. And they, 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 you can see there's this energy and humour that flows through all of them, which translates to the film. So like slime and all that kind of stuff. So all of those kind of things has been translated for them. And our job would really is to kind of show, well, these are the people who actually did it. And they were a good laugh. I'd love to, I really, even after doing this, I'd love to have worked on Ghostbusters. A bit young, fair, to, to be fair. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> child labour laws might have been different back then. I don't know, but that would have been a great film to work on. I would have been old enough probably just to bring them their coffee every day. or yeah. <laughs> You know, m- my favorite movie of all time is Jaws. And there's a wonderful, oh, brilliant. yeah, there's a wonderful documentary called The Shark is Not Working. And yeah. now before I, Ghostbusters is in my top four. And after watching your documentary, or even before, before watching your documentary, I always had this idea of Columbia Pictures making this high budget for the time. I mean, pretty good budget special effects heavy, but also uh, just character driven, this wonderful acting ensemble. And I kind of had it in my brain that, well, these genius directors and musicians and and special effects people, they just made this movie, you know, as a, te- you know, they're, they're such craftsmen. They made this movie and I had no idea, much like Jaws, that the set and everything, the production was filled with, with problems. And one thing I was watching in your documentary, like even the car, Ecto-1, it reminded me of the shark in Jaws that never worked. Like when you guys were describing and people were describing and telling the stories about 
they had to push the car at some points and it had to go down a hill for it to be able to, to maneuver down the street because it wasn't always, you know, it was a restored old car. It wasn't working all yeah. the time. And I love those stories about happy accidents and, uh, and I'm not giving away too much listeners. I mean, this is a two hour documentary that we're going to be talking about here. So you need to watch it. But another great story was like when they couldn't find a, a, a Slimer miniature that they used earlier in the film. So what they did was they were eating peanuts. So they took one and they spray painted it green and kind of inserted it into the film and nobody <laughs> caught it at the time. And I'm like, that is, and, they, and your show even shows the peanut, the, the green for us <laughs> in, in the shell peanut that was used at the, you know, cause they, they had a deadline. I love yeah. these stories that show like these happy accidents or, or overcoming technical difficulties. Cause you think, a Hollywood film, a major Hollywood studio making a film. Well, you know, it's smooth sailing. No, not at all. <laughs> and I think, I think a lot, I mean, I, I talk to a lot of indie, indie, independent filmmakers. I interview a lot of them, you know, and it's all about problem solving. So it's interesting, even at that level, you don't just kind of throw money at it because maybe you've got a time constraint and you can't just throw money at it. So it's just this, like you say, happy happenstances. But I think it also very much highlights just how ingenious these people were, mm. you know, and they they were just very resourceful. Yeah, you know, they were. And it's and it's, and it's kind of filmmaking. It's a fun yeah, of filmmaking. Yeah, it but is. Nothing, you know, what put me off wanting to do film for years was you, you think everything's like, like you say, super yeah. polished and organised and things like that. And I am just not that kind of person. But to sort of like think, well, no, sometimes it's just like, right, okay, well. And then you find out when you just, when you do more interviews and you meet people that work in the industry, it's like, well, no, the, the, the location fell through sort of like midnight last night. Oh, but that all seemed to work. Yeah, I know. It just was just the way that it worked. But there's so much that's sort of like, okay, this is now what's happened. How are we going to adapt to it? And I've been through it. I know friends that have been through it. And I remember interviewing Rick Baker years ago and he sort of like said about like a bloody Kleenex. Works right, you know, tear up, put it in and stick it in there, bloody up. Nobody's going to know the difference. And I was working on a short, I wasn't even sure it was a feature a few years back. And the, um, the fellow that was supposed to be doing all that was taken ill. And they're like, yeah, we need to sort of like look as though there's like a bit, a bit of blood and things like that. It's like, have you got any tissue? He's made up. He's made the blood up. Right, give, leave it to me. So I did it, and I was just like, I was, I was totally in my zone. I was like, this is amazing. This, this is this came from Rick Baker. So it's, but it is all of those things. You know, Jaws is that, exactly yeah. that, and Jaws is a, a pure classic. Oh, I love Jaws. You know, that's and that's right up there for yeah, like it like an flat in London that we yeah. had. It was like there was like the Jaws and there was Ghostbusters. Yeah, there was. That's like, yeah, that's exactly. exactly. So you're in good company here, Brian. <laughs> but it is. It's just you know, I, I love all of that yeah. because um, you know we, we adopted a lot of that when we were doing yeah. the doc there was um we like the whole intro sequence um that we did very much in that vein because the, the original idea and the original plan just completely went down the swan yeah. at the last minute they originally wanted to get into the la firehouse and we were going to shoot in there and going to project images inside up against boxes and sheets and, and all yeah. that kind of stuff and and we flew over there specifically for that. And uh, and what we would actually we went to um, Martha's Vineyard, so we interviewed Michael yeah. Chapman for the Ghostbusters Ghost Two talk. Yeah. So and he when we finished, he was talking to us about Jaws, and it was just like, oh, please for God, of course he worked on Jaws. So he was telling us all about it. It was like, and he took us to this great little shack which did lobster, uh, lobster clam, chowder. Rob, clam chowder and lobster. Oh. Yeah, it was amazing. It was, and it was right next to where is it Quint. It is Quint, isn't it? Yeah. Quint's shack was, and it's like, that was the only building that was temporary and they had to de deconstruct it afterwards because of the way that it's all listed there. And this, this shack is right, you, you probably know about the place, but if, oh, I tell you, absolutely gorgeous. Because you'll never taste anything better than this. And you, hey, it was yeah, right. it was, it was, it was, it was amazing. amazing. Um, so we were, anyway, on that trip, while we were at, on the outskirts of Martha's Vineyard, stopping in the Sleepy Hollow. We were staying yes, in the Sleepy Hollow. Yes, it was. Yeah, it was yeah, cool. it was Sleepy Hollow. Yeah. Um, so we get a call and, and Troy Benjamin, who was such a great help to us, and yeah, he was kind of like become our like LA producer. And, uh, and he goes, yeah, the city's locked that place down. You can't get in. It's like, it's now, you know, it's, it's yeah, deemed it's... unsafe. You can't get in. It's like, well, this oh. is a pickle. <laughs> so we've come here to do this and to go there and now we can't. So we had to come up 
through the trip on the drive through, yeah. <laughs> stopping off at Anthony's, who did our posters and, yeah, and stuff. Yeah, Anthony's and art, yeah. It's like, yeah, I've got this idea, and I think you. Yeah, you had come up with this idea years ago about like using the containment use unit. And and I think I said to you, why don't we use a a containment unit? As in like it's the containment of all our memories. And then by it, by the containment unit blasting open, it's uncontaining, you know, like the ghosts blasting out. So that's kind of where that came from. And Richard Edland, John Bruno, uh, um, there was Stuart Ziff. Mark Brian Wilson, Sam Chicarillo of Hollywood Expendables lent us this place to, to shoot. And we they let they only lent us all their props. So they're all original props. So that intro shoot um was all done practically based off of yeah, what we learned it. from from working and interviewing these absolutely geniuses um, in film. And a group of the fans uh, yeah, and South yes. Ghostbusters had, had had this part built ecto containment unit. Yeah. It was all MDF. Yeah. And then so they kind of Wired it all up in Sam's shop and yeah. Sam threw some red light on it. It's like, well, that looks the business. <laughs> and it's like, it's some tape there. No, leave the tape. I said, what we'll do is we'll just, we'll, we'll age it up and we'll yeah. make it look like a rusted, it's been there for yeah. years type of thing. So um, I, 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 I wanted everything done practically. Yeah. And we're like, I wanted all the boxes to have neon around, but obviously that. So it's like, it doesn't matter. I know we can do that. Post. I don't want to do post, but it's, we haven't got Again, any we've got it. Yeah, yeah. It's not like we've got a million pound budget to throw at special no, effects. We did. So it was. So most of that was practical. Then the they had like a C. Well, Photoshop and After Effects polish on the on the containment. I say polish, make it look rusty and stuff. Yeah, and adding the gauges it. and stuff to distress. And then all the smoke was practical. So that was in our kitchen. Using yeah. how they shot, shot Slimer. So there was, Claire was wrapped in black. Yeah. We had some black cards with a black shoebox with a whole front. Contact, yeah. And one of our lights um, shining behind it. There was Luis who was helping us out. And he was, I, I had this old um, smoke machine, which I had to jerry rig because it was completely <laughs> knackered. So we was actually kind of, kind of crack it open and pour this solution in. And so we just, okay. And it's like, like action, and then it's like okay, not 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 open, and things like this, and and it comes up, and the lens flares comes off. Yeah. It worked, and it then did. you just superimpose it over, and the lens, so the lens flares and things like that. So there's a lot of that was all was all practical. It was it's all just a bit of, our DOP here. <laughs> so it was just taking that premise. You know, yeah, listening to you explain like how you put that that uh, that part of your show together, it, it kind of drew uh, uh, comparisons in my brain on the puppeteers during uh, during your show that were talking about, like, for example, the library ghost and how originally they were like, how are we going to do this the way that we did, you know, and, and there's going to take a team of, of, of puppeteers and all this. And so, but they figured it out with one person and, and just the evolution of that, I thought was very, very interesting. Now, wa- now for me watching it, and I wouldn't call myself an expert on Ghostbusters. I mean, I've read different articles and uh, I think I read a, some book about it, or it was mentioned in a book, but I've seen it a million times. Love it. Like I said, it's in my top four or five movies of all time. Uh, that being said, since I was so Ghostbusters kind of crazy, I couldn't believe the things that I didn't know about Ghostbusters that were revealed in in your in your doc. The things about like uh, John Candy uh, being Lewis Tully uh, early on, perhaps. I mean, they, I mean, they were considering him, and he was he was offering his input. And obviously we talked about John Belushi and then Eddie Murphy was going to be uh, Winston Zeddemore that was originally written for him. And then I saw you had like uh, Daryl Hannah was uh, they had a screen test for her for the film. And I had no idea that was going on. Um, and then we got to to um, Ernie Hudson and I thought he was very gracious uh, and he explained a lot in there. Having Ernie in your documentary, obviously he was disappointed how the script changed, which I didn't know. Um, you know, as it came up to start principal photography, were there any were there big surprises that you that you didn't know about when people started talking, like Ernie Hudson's kind of disappointment and things like that? Yeah, that was that was definitely one of them. The other one um, was the, the the credits and um, you know the, the people that have worked in the for for Boss Film really. The cre- they were either cut out or they weren't given the right job titles. And I kind of made it this crusade, didn't I? That so was like, well, we're a documentary about Ghostbusters. We need to set the record straight. So um, so I kind of badgered 
poor Richard Edland. I'm like, have you got that original list? Have you got that original list of, of and who should be credited for what? And um, so that was something for me that was very important. And of course, in the uh, the end of the documentary, we, we do list everybody how they because it should have been correctly credited for the the you know the for the function they performed in the film um so that was that one for me in particular i mean because this year there was there was always something like that there was and some things just didn't make their way to the dock but i mean i know the thing with ernie mm. i'm sure i knew about it but i did not know to the extent and everyone sort of like says oh because it was eddie murphy and it was just like it didn't really kind of he was kind of kind of a an idea, but it never, I don't think, but certainly by the time it got to Ivan, according to what he was saying, he never got that kind of far. It was just sort of like, he was a kind of consideration, but once Belushi died, then that was, that was basically it really. So, um, and I know other people's were kind of considered for the part, but it was, I, I, yeah, I didn't know. And then certainly the way that it all happened. And, and it's like I say, Ernie, I mean, Ernie is a legend. Yeah, he's uh, the he most amazing just, person. Such a lovely man. And, yeah. um, and, and he's, you know, and he is fine. Like most, you know, things happen that, that long in the past you sort of like you adjust to things and and you see them from different angles and stuff which he does now mm. but that must have been really hard to kind of like to to kind of cope with what happened then and everything that he was kind of like going through so that was you know a quite a big reveal for us and and the other thing we always sort of like talk about it's like and the amount of that kind of knowledge and genius that went on behind yeah. the camera like you know the fact that when boss film went in to kind of like do this they had absolutely yeah. nothing at at sort of like at the facility, they had like a few bits and bobs and they just had to basically build stuff. It's like, and you just, and it's those things you just don't even think yeah. about. It was pioneering yeah. um, work basically, wasn't it, by Boss Film. They were literally building cameras from, from you know, from nothing. And then, you know, going to Kodak, you're right, we need film stock to be running at such and such a speed. You know, it was just complete ingenuity. And we had no idea of that. Yeah. Um, until we sat, you know, with with Richard Edland and Terry Windell, that was kind of what kick started. That wasn't. Yeah, it, really? it was really. Yeah, because they just, you know, it's one of those things. You go there with your kind of set of questions, and you never know what people are kind of going to answer to, or even mm. have got enough time to answer all the questions. Um, and, and everyone was always very giving with with that, yeah, and they were very you generous. can kind of tell that it is just one of those films. And even John Bruno, we was talking to him the other night. Funnily enough, and he goes, it was just for my career, it was, it was a career changing film. And it wasn't just him, there was a whole yeah. bunch of people. Sigourney Weaver was another Sigourney, one. Yeah, 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 I mean, all of them really. I mean, it yeah. really elevated everyone to a completely different level in their career. Yeah. But you can see there is this huge fondness. Yeah. And, and especially with all the stress they must have gone under to, to get this film made, because that, you know, back in an era where it should have taken at least two years to get that, but, you know, Star Wars, Star Wars films like three years at that point. So it's, you know, you, you get to that kind of stage of frustration, but they're still reminiscing about it as a, just like a huge fond memory. Yeah. So very affectionately. It's, it's quite encouraging for people yeah. like us when, you know, we're making these things or you're venturing out into the film industry and you, these are seasoned professionals, but they can still look back and they're still huge film fans. They're still yeah. passionate about their art. And that's really sort of like nice to kind of, to be a, like be a part of all of that, meet these people, and even reconnect some of these people because yeah, some of them are drifted apart, and then yeah, the film did do that. But it was, but yeah, there was. I mean, there's a lot of nice little kind of gems in there, and it was just, it was just the hardest thing sometimes to cut into my mouth because there's still things that I'd found out, and you think, oh, we must put that in the doc, and you can see it in your head, and then when you edit it all together, it's like it just doesn't fit. It's like, you know, like Bob Stevens talking about Jason Reitman yeah. and, and like, him, like, oh, he's little Jason putting him up and he looked through the lens and said he probably doesn't remember that now. And now he's Jason Reitman. And this was before, he, you know, doing Ghostbusters films, he was still doing these indie films. So, yeah. ah. so you, you conducted uh, dozens and dozens of interviews, hundreds and hundreds of hours to go through. Uh, did you guys reach out to Bill Murray? Did you guys reach out to him? So who's Bill Murray? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, I've I'm not, I'm not come across that name before. You know, there was always... Was a, one of those cleaners I was talking about earlier? Yeah. <laughs> Assistant sculptor. I think well, he's been got the town all right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right yeah. I, th- I think it probably made him a very wealthy man. I think so. <laughs> Mr. Murray. <laughs> Murray. Um, yeah, we did. The other night. Yeah, yeah, we know. We, we, 
he actually agreed to do the film. I I, I spoke to him myself and um, a different because uh, we in England we have um, a, a company called Premier Scene where we we do filmmaker interviews, red carpet. We go to press junkets and whatever and and press conferences. And he was a a couple. And I went up to and spoke to him. I said, "We're from the Ghostbusters documentary. He knew all about us. Will you do the doc?" And he says, "Yes." So when I when you know I call his um, legal representative, um, you know she basically says, "Well, what Bill says he does and what he does are two different things." And um, so we tried for years and years. At the end of the, the film, when you watch the credits, you'll see me actually speaking to Bill Murray and him actually saying yes. But you know he 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 dances to his own tune and. I mean, for us, I think that the big thing as well, and I hope that the film demonstrates, is that it was at this this a, a film is a team effort. It's a collaboration, and as much as Bill Murray was a, um, an important part, he is not the singularly most important part of the film. Mm. And um, and I hope that he is present within the film in the respects that people have, have, have talked about his contribution. But literally, I mean, I've even got that famous number that um, that I called and called and tried to Sophia Coppola route, um, you know, phoning every day and it just went to a voicemail and we just never got anywhere. So um, I was told I need to be pretty and blonde and that would have made all the difference. So I'm sorry, audiences, we were scuppered from the start there. That was oh, <laughs> you know, it uh, went, but, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, it's like because it, it, well, it was always a thing. Even just well, before we started making the doc, it was always you'll never get Bill Murray, and it was just like, and it always really got up my nose because it's like that's you're kind of missing the point. It's like it's one. It's not about kind of meeting famous people. It's no. about shining a light on the on the skills and the talent of people in front of and behind the camera. And then and it's like Claire said, it, it's not that it doesn't rely on one person. Yeah, there are some films that obviously they, that a certain person is the main star and they carry mm-hmm. that particular film. But you know, really, when and break and and you can't knock you know the presence that Bill Murray has within Ghostbusters, yeah. but he isn't the only one. Mm-hmm. And it's. You know, it was just as important for us. It was kind of, I wanted to interview him purely. Well, I mean, we have interviewed him. We have him interviewed him for things, lots of different things, but just, it's just not like, that. Not Ghost Ghost um, but it was just like, it was just as important for us to sort of like say, yeah. you know, his presence is felt in a film. And, you know, that's you kind of come back and it certainly kind of felt like that while we were putting it all together. And it would have been nice and it still would be nice to sort of like get that interview with him just to kind of get, because he's quite an honest person person like that yeah. I think I think you'd get quite a kind of like blunt as such but you, you wouldn't it would be candid. Yeah, yeah, be candid yeah yeah and, and I you know the thing for us as well is that the people that we interview are not just objects they know owe us nothing it was our choice mm. to make this film and so if people want to be a part of it and 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 talk about and reminisce that's absolutely brilliant and and we want to we want to hear the stories but we don't know whether he wants to be associated with Ghostbusters. We don't know what his experience was like. And yes, we would like to hear it, but we also have to respect that he owes us nothing. Mm-hmm. It was our choice to make this yeah. film and it, it, we can offer the invite. And if he feels that he can give us time to do it, fantastic. And if he doesn't want to, well, we have to respect that as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for us, the important one was Bill, uh, was, was Dan yeah. Aykroyd. Yeah. Oh, you have all all the major stars and all the major players that were involved in Ghostbusters in your documentary. And although it would have been nice to have, you know, Bill Murray to to share some insight and thoughts, there's plenty of people on that production in that movie that did talk about the Bill Murray experience. And I'm not going to give away too much because I want people to watch it. But Annie Potts is... Uh, <laughs> Yes. What, Annie Potts putting Bill Murray in his place is worth watching the documentary just to have her explain it in her own language and words. It was incredible. <laughs> well, yeah, we, she she was amazing, wasn't She's, she? I, I, and I she just she, she came to the door. Do you remember when we were interviewing her, and we just didn't even recognise her. She's just so luminous and, and attractive, and, and not that she wasn't in the film, but she's just, just like I didn't. I'm not she looks so door, young, and I thought it was yeah, an assistant. Yeah, yeah. Oh. she had these big kind of like sunglasses on. She yeah. was like, hi, and I was just like, oh my god, I'm just, okay, it's, 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 okay, right. Oh, come come through, come through. Did not. Twitter at all. She was, she was just, amazing. Yeah, really. Yeah. Actually, yeah, just, you know, and, and that's what they want. Yeah, that spirit of hers just totally 
comes through uh, in the documentary. And so bravo for having her and having her tell that story and having it featured prominently in your in your show because it, it was very, very funny. I'm not going to give it away because I want people no, to don't have- give it away, but yes, it was very funny. Yeah, I totally cackled out loud when I was watching. I was like, that, <laughs> that's hilarious. I really enjoyed that part. Um, so yeah, you guys worked on this for a long time. I mean, over a decade, right? Yeah. 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 12 years it, it was before we, we actually handed it in for delivery. Yeah. Yeah. And now with this new movie that's coming out, Ghostbusters Afterlife, uh, and renewed interest in this uh, documentary of yours, and it's getting a United States release. You want to tease that a little bit or how can people? Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it is out there already on, excuse me, on VOD. Uh, I think it came out the fifth of October, um, and it's across all the major platforms, Apple TV, um, um, iTunes, iTunes uh, Microsoft, uh, Google Play. Uh, okay. There's another one that we don't have over here. I can't <laughs> remember what that is. Um, something like Zulu. It's not Hulu. Oh, I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> it's, it's across VOD. Yeah. And it, and it yeah. It's fan. It's absolutely fantastic. I want all my listeners, to, uh, especially if you, as you're, if you're like my age, our age, and you have great memories of going to the theater and seeing Ghostbusters and Ghostbusters Two, and like I said, I ha- had such a connection to it because I was into, oh, superhero movies and 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 science fiction movies, and what a great movie to, to come out so original with a mixture of like some horror and sci-fi, and just wonderful comedy slapstick intelligent comedy too. I mean, it was just such, such a, such lightning in a bottle. I mean, it was such, it was, oh, there yeah. wasn't a movie like it before. And there are constant imitators that, are, that try to capture that essence of a great ensemble work, special effects, uh, a whip smart script, you know, deft directing, just everything. It just was like almost perfection. And, and so much of it was like improvised and by the seat of their pants. I mean, I don't know if, I can't think of another film assembled in such a way after watching your documentary. I know the now I know the story, but I can't think of another film probably assembled in such a way that turned out to be such a colossal hit and such a major force in pop culture for decades. Yeah, yes. absolutely. And I, and I think, you know, you what, the, what you've got in front of camera is you've got sort of three... Um, you know, they're not classical actors, they're comedians. And they had worked together for, for many years. Yeah. So you've got that chemistry on screen already with them bouncing off each other. And then you surround them with these classically trained theatre actors who are, you know, they're playing it straight. And they just, it just adds to that. Um, it's almost like a, a tennis game, yeah. isn't it? You, you know what I mean? The interaction um, between all of these actors um, you know, and in, at the centre of it, of course, are these comedic actors where they're allowed to be funny. Yeah. And but even then, they're not playing it for laughs. It's it's kind of exactly. It's not it's not goofball. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. That, you yeah. Know, that's the thing with Ghostbusters, and I, you know, it does. It's it stands out as as a classic of yeah. the era because it is you know it's unique. It's you know even you know, and I love Ghostbusters too. It's a great film, but it doesn't replicate what Ghostbusters was, you know, in, in any shape, way or form. It's, you know, Ghostbusters 2 does feel like its own film, to be to be fair, which is I think is perfectly fair. But it's, you know, there is something raw about Ghostbusters. It kind of, the way it's captured New York mm-hmm. at that particular point in time, you know, everything became much more kind of sanitised after that, where, you know, it's like I said earlier, it just, it was this kind of crossover event where you got the people behind the camera, that, you know, changing their kind of career paths. If you to, to a certain degree, everyone's kind of moving from ILM and they kind of want to set up their own thing. So everyone's kind of coming together there. You've got everyone in front of the camera coming together. You've got Ivan, who's done a few films by that point. And now it's sort of like, okay, we're going to kind of make the next step. Let's make this one. This, this will be all right. Special effects film should be fine. And it just becomes something. And I think if they, you know, it makes you wonder if they knew exactly what they were getting themselves into, would they have approached anything any differently? And, you know, the fact that it's a bit kind of rough around the edges and and, and people's experiences maybe with that genre of film and that lot might not have been as, as finely tuned as they eventually become, they, they, it, it kind of creates this fluidity that everyone's kind of open to suggestions and sort of like, and to other people's sort of like expertise. It's sort of like, you know what? And I've certainly done jobs like that where it's just like, I, I don't know that. 
but you know that, so you do that, so I'll do this. And I'll try and learn from you, and you try and learn from me. And that was actually Richard's mm. like um, philosophy with mm. Boss Film, was that it was uh, based off the Hunting Bank Project, which is a, a Native American uh, term that's sort of like, even though people within tribes would have their own specific tasks, but they would have overlapping tasks. So one could the take over one and yeah. roll. So everyone could know and appreciate everybody else's job, even though they had their own specific thing to do. And that's really that. And that there's no single film. point of failure there, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. So you've got someone like Sigourney, who's sort of like known as a straight mm. actress, doing like Alien and coming off of the back of all those kind of things and not known as as a comedic actress and, and the mm. likes of Bill and all the rest of them that aren't seen as straight actors either. And, mm. But then they've got this film where they can have a stab at all yeah. of it. Mm-hmm. And it, I just think it, it, Ghostbusters really does work on so many levels. Mm-hmm. And, and it's just that, and you can, and hopefully through the doc, you can kind of see why that works because of the various personalities they've got together, the various skill sets have come together. And then this film has kind of come out of it. That's, that's still sort of like to this day. And as is, indeed. Yeah, as indeed. Like people yeah. that weren't even born when the films came out are just sort of huge fans go dressed up as Ghostbusters, spend, you know, thousands building proton packs and all that kind of stuff. And and for films, I, I mean I I get it. I was I was I was there at the time, but others weren't. But yeah. they still they still um become attached to it in that yeah, way. And that's yeah. that just sort of like shows a testament to it. And there isn't really that I don't know Comic Cons and and all those things are, are are a big deal. But for a film to kind of transcend from from like like Back to the Future, like Jaws, that it goes from being that one, you know, that's the next like summer film to becoming something much more. Whereas there was many others that kind of came out at the time. Well, eighty four was a good year. We had Terminator that year. Right. <laughs> well, I got to hand it to you because you you told such a thorough and complete picture of the of of the of the movie. I, I'm a musician, and even your oh. in, in even your explanation or the explanations about how the soundtrack came together and how uh, the the wonderful rich orchestral score of the movie and even the Yamaha DX7, which we had, uh, you know, everybody around here had a DX7 at one point, how that was just a basic sound that was used. I mean, just all these great little nuggets of, of information. Now, now we're all old, you know, um, codgers now. Do you, <laughs> that is true. Do you guys have, like, as I do, this kind of like youthful excitement coming up for next month with Ghostbusters Afterlife. I like everything that I've seen in the trailer. I like the I like uh, how they're approaching the film. Um, you know, kind of continuing the storyline from one and two. Are you guys as excited as I am uh, to see Ghostbusters Afterlife? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's a short answer yeah. to that one. It's like, <laughs> yes, I am. Yeah. yeah. A chance to you know, I don't think it, there was times when we done stuff we were working on the dock long before this was even like a, a possibility and and thinking god it would be amazing to see like terror dogs back on screen again because there's such a great you know and another thing with you know it, it, the way it there's things played for last like slime out there's things that aren't funny like the terror dogs which i remember when they played on tv here at like five in the afternoon they edited out any scene where you could see the terror dog full on was all edited out and that's that shows because it's quite a scary creature and now we've got like and now we've got a film that's coming and it's just it, it's uh, I, I am i am i'm quite it, excited it about very, it. we're gonna, we're gonna see all of that kind of stuff again we're getting a chance to revisit something in a fresh new way and that's only the stuff that we've seen in trailers. We, you know, there's still another two hours of film that's yeah. going to come. So, what else that's kind of planned and they're going to do and where it's going to go? I just, I, I'm, <laughs> and, and and I think that you know, Jason Reitman is he's already uh, you know earned his stripes as a director and, and filmmaker. So you know, he he is very much a character driven director which is the kind of films I want to see um and so uh, you know who's I think that I think the kind of legacy of Ghostbusters is in the best hands it could possibly yeah. be in really to to you know to carry it into the future I know that was it because it was like, and definitely nothing against like the 2016 film, no right? but it's like it and that film itself is of a style yeah you know it's not a mimic what kind of came before which is which was a good thing to do and it well it is its own thing it just uses the same kind of sort of like theory of what, I mean what I, do, I did not oh, enjoy I that we, we went to see it didn't we and yeah, we, we were entertained laugh. yeah we yeah, had a good we laugh we had a good laugh out loud in some yeah. places got the old nostalgia yeah. twinge when it was on but this is like 
a film, that, and you can see, even just see yeah. the cinematography that, you know, I've seen an interview where somebody was discussing the cinematography of Ghostbusters, like it's shot like a thriller. Oh no, it's like yeah. shot like a sci-fi film. Yeah. Not a comedy. And there's, you know, and, you know I mean? and the more you kind of study about films, you realise the way things look the way they do. And I'm fascinated to learn about that stuff. And, you know, you know, comedies look one way and, and Ghost on Ghostbusters 2 looks mm. a certain kind of way, to, to be fair. So everywhere, everything has its own sort of like identity and, and the 2016 film does. But this, yeah. you know, the, this one, Afterlife, it's like you can see, you can see kind of E.T. in certain shots there and Close Encounters. It's, it's got yeah, that kind of yeah. vibe going on to it. There was, there was a friend of mine, there was someone we knew, um, has got an Ecto in the UK. Uh, and I think he's toyed with the idea of selling it. And it's like, if we buy that, you know, it's going to be summer in a couple of months. We can tear through a few cornfields and we can just, <laughs> just like a tray, like, go, I had the whole thing planned in my head. It never came up. <laughs> well, I absolutely have had just a ball talking to you too. And I'm so glad that this worked out. And because I, I have a lot of respect for that documentary. And I know that you worked super hard on it for a long time. And the love that you guys had for that project and for the subject matter of the project, Ghostbusters, remembering Ghostbusters. Uh, it's been so much fun for me to watch that and relive and think about, you know, my childhood and, and how much that movie meant to me and to be able to share this hour with you guys talking about the, your fantastic documentary, the, the fantastic movie that Columbia Pictures made back in 1984 and, and to speculate and be excited about the future. I, I can't thank you two enough for being a part of the show tonight. Thank you, Brian. Thank you for thank you for having us. And, and I have to say, for all, all of us in the team that worked on the documentary, um, not just Anthony and I, but Anthony Zart and, and Derek, Derek Osborne, Osborne and Jamie and, and Dave, who did the score. You know, we all we all come from a very passionate place, and without their hard work and and everybody that's helped us along the way, we couldn't have made the film that we. Yeah, made. exactly. It's a it's a, you know I always say about like a director and all that kind of stuff, but it's you know. I, I'm a bit funny about it because it's like it's really without all of us coming together to be able to make this thing, it wouldn't happen. So it doesn't matter about directors and all that kind of stuff. Maybe producers. We're going to get a stick otherwise. Um, but <laughs> May and my ego in. <laughs> it's you know you do, you, because you know you work in sort of like you know yeah. living on baked beans and uh, on toast, which I do like baked beans on toast. I'm very good at cooking baked beans on toast. Um, but you know you you have to rely on people with the same kind of dedication and passion and passion. And we were very lucky to find that, you know, so um, if it weren't for all of us coming together to make this thing, there wouldn't be a doc that that there is on Ghostbusters now that I'm really, I'm, you know, and it's nice because I can sit there and feel very proud of the final film because thinking, well, it wasn't just me. It wasn't just me and Claire. It was, we've all put in and we've all done everything we can to, to, to bring it to light and hopefully tell the best story that we can. And and hopefully that's exactly what we were were able to achieve in the end. Well, thank you very much for uh, talking not only about the story of Ghostbusters, but thank you for sharing with my listeners and, and with me your story because it's it's fascinating and you guys are very generous with your time and I can't thank you enough for being a part of the program. No, pleasure. Thank you, no, thank you. Thank you Brian. Thank you for having us on. There we go, kids. Anthony and Claire Bueno. Cleaning up the town, remembering Ghostbusters. If you haven't watched it yet, by all means, do so now. So cool to talk to them. They're over there in England, and I'm here in the haunted heartland of Omaha, Nebraska. And what a great gift I have with this podcast to be able to talk to people all over the world. And for people all over the world to be listening to me right now. I do not take it for granted. Thank you so very much. And with that... Episode 214, coming out in a couple weeks, we're going to be commemorating the uh, assassination of John F. Kennedy with my guest, Craig Ciccone, one of the leading researchers, scholars of not only the Kennedy assassination, but all political assassinations of the 1960s. It's going to be a heavy show, but so enlightening with the pursuit of truth with Craig Ciccone coming up next on the Necronomicast. So thank you for listening. We're going to be winding down 2021 with a special show in December. Details to come. Take care, everybody. Now go get some sleep. <laughs>